They said, yes, of course, we will believe you. We have never experienced any lying coming from you. And so the Prophet wasallam said, that in that case, I tell you, that I am a warner for you, warning you of a great punishment that is ahead of you. Meaning, accept Islam. Otherwise, a great punishment is going to befall you. And so, one of his uncles, Abu Lahab, who was a severe opponent of him and of his Islam that he was spreading, he said, Tabban lak, may you be ruined, may you be destroyed. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent those verses in the Quran, which have been recited and which are continuously being recited until this day. Tabbat yada abi lahabim wa tab. May the hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed, be perished, be ruined. And so, this was the reality. The da'wah became public after once upon a time, it was kept behind closed doors. And so, naturally there would be consequences to this. Naturally, there would be harms in the way of publicly announcing the da'wah. Among those harms and consequences was the fact that there would be denial of what the Prophet ﷺ came with. Outright denial of the most obvious facts of the existence of Allah, of the fact that Allah alone deserves to be worshipped, of the fact that there will be resurrection after we die, and so on and so forth. Not only that, but mockery, making fun of our Prophet ﷺ and of the companions, and the list goes on and on. But the reality is that this is something that the companions, that even the Prophet ﷺ was prepared for. And so, for the last three years, they were ready for this. They knew this day would come, and they knew it would be difficult. And so, when the revelation first came to our Prophet ﷺ, he went to his wife Khadija, and she was the first to believe in him. And he was shivering. And he was in a state of shock because he had never experienced anything like it before. So she took our Prophet ﷺ to her cousin, an individual known as Waraqa bin Nawfal, who was a monotheist, who did not associate partners with Allah. And so he was learned, he knew the scripture, and he knew about these kind of things. So she thought maybe he will be able to help him. And so when she took our Prophet ﷺ to Waraqa bin Nawfal and he explained to him what had happened. Waraqa bin Nawfal said that this is the same angel who came to the previous prophets, Jibreel salam. And one of the things that he said to him is that I wish I was young because he had become an old man and he had become blind. So he says, I wish I was a young man and could live until that day until your people drive you out. And so the Prophet ﷺ was surprised. He was astonished. Will my people, my own people drive me out? He said, yes. In fact, no one before you came with anything similar to that which you have come with, except that he was treated with hostility. He was driven out by his people. And the same thing will happen to you. He said, Waraqa goes on to say, I wish that I live to see that day. Should I live to see that day in which your people will turn you out, I will be with you and I will support you. However, it was only a period of a few days after which Waraqa bin Nawfal had passed away and he died. But the important thing to point out here regarding the da'wah moving on to a new level, the da'wah becoming something public, is that the confrontation between Islam and its opponents was taking on a new face. And it was going on to new places. And so this open opposition to the da'wah 
actually played in favor of the Muslims. And so people started to hear about Islam. Even those outside of Mecca, the news started to spread like wildfire. Why? Because of Quraysh and their media. They were putting all of their energy into warding people away from our Prophet wasallam, Calling him a magician, calling him a poet, calling him a madman, accusing him and his followers of fabricating lies, discrediting him and his followers. Naturally, this caused the message of Islam to spread. People started to ask, what is this new religion? Who are these people? Who is this man? And the reality is that this same thing is happening today. And so our enemy has tried everything they could through their media to portray Islam in the worst of ways, to discredit Islam, to make Islam seem like something barbaric, like something backward. However, all of that is playing in favor of the Muslims. And so, whenever something happens in the Muslim world or in non-Muslim countries and Islam gets portrayed in a bad light in the media, what happens? People start to hear about Islam. They start to ask, what is this religion? Who was this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And so they start to ask about Islam. They get guided to the light of Islam. And so they start embracing Islam in large numbers. This we have seen time and time again. Among the ways in which this first strangeness of Islam was confronted by the first Muslims and how it was dealt with is that after being confined to the confines of Mecca, it was taken outside of Mecca. And so in the later years of Islam, while the Muslims were still in Mecca, but they were persecuted and they were tortured and there was a boycott against them, a social and economic boycott against them, our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, decided to take the message of Islam outside the borders of Mecca. And so in the worst year that he experienced, the year that is known as Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow, the year of grief for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was the year in which his beloved wife, who had supported him for so long, Khadija radiallahu anha, had passed away. And it was the year in which his uncle had passed away, Abu Talib. Even though he passed away as a disbeliever, he was supportive of him. And so our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not give up. And so he took his message to the city of Ta'if, which is outside of Mecca. And so he was hoping for support from there because his own people rejected him. He needed to search for support from other places. And so what did he face? We hear the account of Aisha radiallahu anha. And so she says, I asked, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did you ever encounter a day harder, more difficult than the day in which the battle of Uhud took place? And so the battle of Uhud was a very, very difficult day for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They did not defeat their enemy. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, having seen that, she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was there a day that was more difficult than this day? So the Prophet ﷺ replied in the affirmative. And he said, Your tribes troubled me a lot. Meaning Quraysh and the other tribes around Mecca. And the worst trouble was on the day of Aqaba. When I presented myself to Ibn Abd al-Yalayl, Ibn Abd Kulal, and he did not respond to my demand. One of the chiefs of Ta'if. When the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if, and he presented Islam to the chiefs of Ta'if. Before we continue this account of what happened on that day, we'll take a quick break and be right back. Oh Allah, I'm begging you. Muhammad, peace be 
pearls of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said, Beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the worst of false tales, and do not look for others' faults, and do not indulge in spying on one another, and do not practice nudge, that is, to offer a high price for something in order to allure another customer who is interested in the thing. And do not be jealous of one another. And do not hate one another. And do not desert one another. And, O Allah's worshippers, be brothers. Sahih Al-Bukhari, Volume 8, Book of Manners, Hadith number 6066. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda. Mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth? And who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik next on Peace TV. Welcome back. Before the break, we were discussing the story of the day of Ta'if when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out in search of support from the people of Ta'if after his own people had rejected him. And so the Prophet ﷺ presented Islam to the chiefs of Ta'if and they rejected him. So the Prophet ﷺ says, speaking to Aisha radiallahu anha, I departed from Ta'if overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. And in some accounts, it mentions how the people of Ta'if threw stones at our Prophet ﷺ until he was bleeding, returning to Mecca. And so I proceeded on. The Prophet ﷺ says, I moved on to Mecca. And on the way, I rested at Qarn al-Tha'alib, a place between Ta'if and Mecca, where I lifted my head towards the sky, and I saw a cloud shading me. And in the cloud was Jibreel alayhi salam. So he called me saying, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has heard your people and what they have done with you, and what they said to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the angel of the mountains to you in order for you to order him to do whatever, whatever you wish to these people. And so the angel of the mountains came and greeted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then said, O oh Muhammad, order me, order me to do what you want me to do. If you want, I could take these two mountains, al-akhshabayn, and make them to fall upon these people. However, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, leave them. Perhaps these people will have children. Their successive generations will worship Allah alone without worshiping anyone else. And so look at the manners and the etiquette of our Prophet ﷺ. In such a grave situation, in such a sorrow situation, in such grief, still, he was a mercy for mankind. And so he did not give up. He did not give up. He returned to Mecca, saddened, but continued his da'wah and continued to preach. And so, in the days of Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ would present Islam to the various tribes that would come from around the Arabian Peninsula also in hope of their support. Perhaps 
one of these tribes would take him in, would give him protection, and allow him to preach the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent him with. And so, this was a huge step in confronting the strangeness of Islam and its followers. And that is because all the tribes of the Arabs used to come in the days of Hajj. They used to come for their rituals. And so, they would come and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would present Islam to them, opening new frontiers for the da'wah, even though Quraysh, they were very aware of this. And they were afraid that what this would do is that it would give the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a chance to spread his message, to move away from them. And then eventually he will come back to conquer them. They were very, very well aware of that. Among the ways in which the first strangeness of Islam was confronted and was dealt with is that the Muslims came out with their Islam in a gradual manner. And that is because Islam was here to stay. And this is something that the Muslims understood. That the reality was that Islam is here. And Islam is here to stay. So eventually we must show the people the Islam that we have. However, this was done gradually, not all of a sudden. And since the Prophet ﷺ had announced his da'wah publicly, every now and then the Muslims would openly start praying, would openly recite the Qur'an. But this was in a gradual manner, not all of a sudden. And it was at certain times. Every now and then, when someone would become Muslim, he would go and announce his Islam publicly. Not everyone. And, you know, there was a time when they would also come out and march in large numbers, showing the strength of the Muslims once they had gained more followers. An example of this is the story of Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, who embraced Islam in those early years. And as a result, Quraysh realized that now the Prophet will have more support. Also, we have the Islam of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, and how on the very day in which he went out to kill the Prophet wasallam, it was the same day that he too became a stranger. And so he embraced Islam. And this was a huge turning point in the da'wah. For once Umar had accepted Islam, the Muslims gained strength and might. And that is because Umar radiallahu an was a staunch opponent of the Muslims. And the Muslims used to fear him because of his strength, his might, and his stature, and how strong he was. And so, ever since he became a Muslim, the Muslims gained some kind of respect. And so Ibn Mas'ud, one of the earlier companions who had accepted Islam in the early days, he says, we have remained mighty and powerful ever since Umar embraced Islam. Not only that, but we have after Umar radiallahu an embraced Islam, as one of the companions, Al-Arqam radiallahu an tells us, that when the Muslims had reached 40 men, the last of whom was Umar ibn al-Khattab, they marched out onto the streets of Mecca, proclaiming their Islam publicly. And so, we see that the Muslims had gained some strength. And there were times when they would show that strength. They would come out in the public showing their strength. However, an important point to mention here is that when he mentions that it was 40 of us who had become Muslim, this does not necessarily mean that it was only 40 Muslims at that time. Because we know that by then there were double that number, at least 80 or 100 Muslims. However, there were those who migrated to Habasha. 
So perhaps this companion was not taking them into consideration. And what we learn here is that this was not something strange regarding Umar radiallahu anh, that the Muslims had gained the upper hand when he had embraced Islam, or at least they gained some strength. And that is because of the personality of Umar, how strong he was, and he did not care about anyone. He did not care about what anyone had to say. And so this is how he was before Islam, and this is how he was after Islam. And that's why our Prophet wasallam said about such people that the best of you in Jahiliyyah, in the days of ignorance, are the best of you in Islam, as long as you perfect your Islam. And this was the reality. We have the example of Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, and we also have the example of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And so we see how the first strangeness of Islam. When Islam began as something strange, we see how this strangeness was confronted, how it was dealt with. In the next episode, we're gonna move on to look at how the strangeness of Islam in the beginning, how it slowly began to fade away until finally Islam was no longer something strange. Until then, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Oh Allah, I'm asking you to make me.